Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Leanna. I hope that you are all coping somewhat well during these times. And uh, I wanted to do just sort of a really chill video where I put on some makeup and talk to you about some of my favorite shows, movies, games, books that I like to read when I'm having a bad day. And I'd kind of conceptualize this video quite a while ago and I figured it would be really relevant right now since um, most of us are staying at home. I know some people are having to still go to work and do various jobs, especially um, people working in healthcare and uh, at pharmacies and grocery stores and things like that. And we really thank you for doing that work right now. And I know that it's not easy, but um, hopefully things will get better soon. And uh, I hope that you'll enjoy this small little video I've put together. So I know that some of you are also indoors right now with small humans, little children. So I'm going to put like some sort of indicator on screen for which of these would be appropriate for families. Because obviously not all of them are, but um, some of them are. So I'll let you know in some sort of fashion. So let's talk about movies. Now the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to talk about things that I would watch on a bad day regardless of what's going on in the world right now and then also uh, at the end of each category just talk about some newer things I've discovered maybe in the last couple of years that you might enjoy because I know some people like to watch the newest thing and maybe not go back in time so much to older things so um yeah I'll let you know some newer things in each category so on my bad days I like to watch superhero movies so obviously the MCU is <laughs> a popular superhero franchise that most people are at least somewhat familiar with at this point even if they haven't watched it and it spans over a decade now it's hard to believe and I really uh, I enjoy most of the movies that are part of the MCU, uh, I would have to say that the Avengers movies are probably one of my favorites. However, I do really enjoy Black Panther. I thought that, that was really good. And outside of the MCU, I also really like uh, the X-Men movies. I like Deadpool. I think Deadpool's hilarious. Uh, that's definitely not <laughs> for, <laughs> for smaller children. And uh, Wolverine. Wolverine was great. Next up, Studio Ghibli. I tend to watch a lot of Studio Ghibli movies when I'm having a bad day. They're the types of movies that I could watch genuinely over and over and over again. I tend to really revisit things that... Uh, I've seen a lot because that way I don't really have to think about them too much. I can just sit there and relax and if I feel like I need to close my eyes now and then as sometimes I do on the worst of the worst days, I know that I'm not missing anything that I haven't seen <laughs> quite a few times before. So some of my favorite Studio Ghibli movies, definitely I have to mention My Neighbor Totoro. That is the very first Studio Ghibli movie I've ever seen. I used to rent it with my brother. Uh, we, were, we were very small ourselves. Uh, about four years old. I was about four years old, so he would have been about eight. And we rented it so often from Blockbuster. I'm pretty sure every time he went in there, they were probably wondering, are they going to rent that movie again? <laughs> And, uh, yeah, sometimes we definitely were renting that movie again. It's just such a sweet and wholesome movie about a family in the Japanese countryside and uh, two little girls who are coping without a mother. Um, so they kind of just need an escape. And the youngest daughter, the youngest sister, she wanders into the forest and she finds... The forest spirit Totoro, who's this really cute 
but giant, uh, sort of a raccoon-like creature, and uh, he helps them. He helps them during their time of grief, and it's just really beautiful. Some of my other favorites from Studio Ghibli: Spirited Away. I've seen Spirited Away many, many times. Uh, it's one of the more mature Studio Ghibli movies, but it's it's so colorful. All of their movies are so colorful and vibrant, and the the backgrounds are like watercolor portraits, basically. They're amazing. And so this is about a young girl who uh, her parents are forcing her to move and change scenery, which she's not very happy about, and her parents get turned to pigs. And so she goes on this amazing adventure to try and turn them back. And there's witches and there's dragons, and it's so cool. And she finds herself along the way. A lot of studio, studio Ghibli movies have a young female protagonist who's really strong, which I always really liked because, you know, a lot of the movies I watched growing up didn't always have a strong female character. They were usually looking for a strong man to help them out. And so I felt like the Studio Ghibli movies really changed that because they didn't always have a love interest. Sometimes there were men there, but they didn't need them. They were strong on their own. It was more about um, definitely finding out more about their own identities during their journeys and uh, like friendships and magic but magic that had a lot to do with like the environment because Hayao Miyazaki is a, a real environmentalist and so he put a lot of those messages in his movies. But I'd be remiss if I didn't mention one of the other directors at Studio Ghibli, which is Isao Takahata, who sadly is no longer with us, but uh, his movies were also really wonderful and they had less fantasy element to him, but um, a lot more uh, real world um, sort of familial elements to them and the storytelling behind those is also just absolutely beautiful and really really touching. A lot of these movies are really really emotional and will get to you <laughs> and uh, make you feel a certain way, especially one of my favorites when Marnie was there, which I did a whole review on and um, makes me cry whenever I watch it. So if you are in need of a good cry and you want to watch a movie either by yourself or with your family, because it is definitely um, child appropriate, maybe not like super young children, but um, probably like eight and up, then it's probably one of the best animated movies you could watch. I also have a real thing for um, romance comedies and romantic comedies from the 60s all the way up to the early 2000s. So things with like Audrey Hepburn in them, like the movie Sabrina is a real good one. Um, but I'm also like into a lot of the Meg Ryan movies and ones that had Tom Hanks in them in particular, so Sleepless in Seattle. And you've got Mail. In the early 2000s had a lot of kind of seminal romantic comedies for my generation, so 13 going on 30, which is actually a lot smarter than people give it credit for. And actually a lot of people ended up writing articles about it uh, just within the last few years to kind of bring up the fact that it was kind of, it was kind of um, pretty pretty genius some of the things it touched on, just the fact that when we're younger we're always waiting to be older. We're always waiting for the time when we'll be able to do this, do that, because we feel like when we're older we'll be able to unlock all these sort of mysteries of life. But then when we do grow up, we realize it's not like that. It's not like that at all. And then we we beg and plead to be younger. And so no matter what stage you are in life, you're never really 
happy with where you're at. And it really captured that quite well. And also uh, Mean Girls. Mean Girls came out just within a year of 13 going on 30. It's still one of the most quoted movies <laughs> from that time, for sure. I think there's not too many people my generation who haven't seen that movie and who don't quote it on occasion. It's just a super funny movie. Even for people who don't particularly like that genre, which I don't particularly like romantic comedies. I just watch them at very specific times, like when I'm not feeling well. But also John Hughes movies. John Hughes movies were always some of my favorites. Weird Science, Pretty in Pink, Breakfast Club. One of the most iconic filmmakers of the 80s and definitely wrote a lot of movies that some people don't even realize he wrote. A lot of Christmas classics. Um, he wrote or he either wrote or produced Christmas Vacation, which I've seen every year of my life since I was a kid, <laughs> which probably I shouldn't have seen it quite as young as I did, but you know, it's awesome. It's hilarious. And from this same genre of movies, uh, Mel Brooks movies, comedies, they're not necessarily romantic comedies, but they're comedies. So that's why I'm lumping it in with these. One of my favorite movies of all time is the original uh, movie version of The Producers, which has Zero Mostel and Gene Wilder, and Gene Wilder is just so funny. Oh my god. <laughs> I love that man so much. Um, definitely a hilarious movie. Uh, I'm gonna zoom you in a little bit for the eye look, which I had something very specific in mind for. Of course, there's always fantasy movies. Um, basically, I enjoy watching Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings <laughs> when I'm not feeling well. And I would, I would very much like to do a binge watching session of Lord of the Rings soon because it's been a while for me. So I'm just using a matte bright teal through my crease. One of my older favorites from when I was a child is the Page Master. I absolutely love the Page Master. But I haven't seen it in a few years now. I'd like to watch it again, but it was part animated and part live action, which made it a bit unique. It had Macaulay Culkin in it, actually. It was just about this boy who, uh, has an adventure while he's at the library. There's adventure. He finds three books and there's adventure, there's fantasy, and there's horror. And he kind of goes through the land of each in order to go through to the end and find the page master. And it was just a really unique, really unique movie. Nothing quite like it. Sci-fi, some of my favorites are fairly new. I say they're within the last 15 years. So um, Ex Machina is one of my favorites. I still have to do a video on that uh, because <laughs> there's a lot to talk about there actually. Um, Moon, which I have done a video on and also its spiritual sequel Mute both done by Duncan Jones. Inception is one of my favorites, actually. <laughs> I just think that it's such a cool concept to go within dreams because I've, I've always had just the smallest ability to lucid dream sometimes. So when I'm in a, a dream, sometimes, not all the time, sometimes I'm conscious of them, conscious of the fact that I'm in a dream. I'll be like, I know I'm dreaming right now, so I'm going to do this. It was a really neat idea. Uh, some people believe that it was the movie Inception was based off of Paprika, an anime movie. 
And to me, they're fairly different. Um, Paprika is pretty weird. Inception is a lot less weird. Um, and also Interstellar, if uh, you enjoy Christopher Nolan's sci-fi. Interstellar is also really good. It has a lot to do with outer space, but also a lot to do with family, um, father-daughter relationships, which was really cool. And I thought that he did a really good job on that. It's not everyone's favorite Christopher Nolan movies. I tend to like the Christopher Nolan movies that people like the least. <laughs> I don't know why that is, but yeah. And sometimes I like to go for dramas um, just because if I'm feeling miserable, I want people to feel miserable with me. So I'll watch a movie where people are just having a real hard time. <laughs> Um, uh, one such movie is Mat Mysterious Skin, which is really dark and definitely do not watch that if you are not looking for something that is very bleak, uh, not for kids, not in the least. It's my favorite Joseph Gordon-Levitt performance. I think he does an amazing job in that movie. Black Swan is one of my favorites as well. I just, I, I used to dance when I was younger until I injured myself and got chronic pain. So I just have always really enjoyed watching dancing on screen, especially ballet. And the, the dancing in that movie is exquisite, but I also really enjoy the sort of um, mental health and psychosis aspects to it. Uh, sort of this, the inner struggle for perfectionism that the lead character has, uh, played by Natalie Portman. She does a really good job with that. A movie that not a lot of people know about is Take Shelter with Michael Shannon, who's one of my favorite actors. And uh, this also has a, a bit to do with mental health and how we treat people um, who we perceive as being ill and not taking them seriously. It's also a little bit of an uh, of a sort of um downplayed disaster movie um a man keeps warning everyone around him that a really bad storm is going to come because he's been dreaming of it and nobody believes him because he has a history of mental illness and it's just a really beautifully shot movie beautifully performed and not a lot of people have seen it, so if you get the chance to see it, please see it. So I'm going to wrap up the movie category with some newer movies that I've seen and really enjoyed. The Peanut Butter Falcon. This was a really touching movie uh, with Shia LaBeouf and Zach Gottskin, who has Down Syndrome, and he plays a, a guy living in a retirement home and he knows that he really shouldn't be there. It's not the right place for him. So he keeps trying to escape. And he has dreams of being a professional wrestler. So eventually he does escape and uh, he runs into Shia LaBeouf's character, who's a, a fisherman kind of caught up in some illegal doings. And they kind of run away together and their bond forms. And it's just really, really sweet. I lost my body. This was one of the animated feature nominees at the, at the Oscars this past year. And it's about, it's kind of hard to explain it without it sounding really strange. It's actually not as strange as you would think. It's about a severed hand who tries to find its way back to it, its body. Um, throughout the movie, you see different clips of the body's owner up to the point that the hand became severed from it um and sort of from childhood to adulthood and up to the accident and eventually they're reunited but a lot of stuff happens along the way and the animation was really unique i believe it was a french animated movie french animation is really interesting and beautiful and the story the story was uh not one i was expecting i got quite emotional at the end there and the invisible man was really good i actually got to see this in theaters just before um the coronavirus covid19 got really bad 
here in North America. And it was really, really tense. I posted a, a short post about it on Instagram saying that it's not quite typical horror movie violence. It has a lot to do with abuse and uh, gaslighting in particular. So it can be a bit touchy for for certain audience members, I think. So if, if that's something that could really trigger you, I, I don't recommend watching it. And the violence is a little unsettling just in that respect because it is more of an abusive relationship type of horror movie, not um, the boogeyman is out to get you, you know? The boogeyman is your abusive ex. Uh, so yeah, just like a little warning for that movie, but it was done really well. I think it captured what it was trying to say really well, and the performances were great. So now we're gonna head on to TV shows. Most of you already know that I'm a huge anime fan. <laughs> So again, I do tend to gravitate more towards shows that I've seen repeatedly and shows that I kind of grew up with, um, including Cardcaptor Sakura. That's just one of my favorite shows from when I was a kid. And they did um, sort of an upgraded version, a sequel called Clear Card a few years ago. I also really enjoyed that. Um, the original series will always be one of my favorites. And I do hope that they continue Clear Card because it's it's basically the same show, just a little bit newer animation. Uh, the stories continued on a few years later, and it's it's just great. It's a it's a magical girl anime. What do you want from it, right? It's it's uplifting. It's cute. It's sweet. And similar in, in that vein is Sailor Moon, of course. Also had an updated version of it a few years ago, Sailor Moon Crystal, which I actually didn't like as much as the version I grew up with, not because of any sort of nostalgia, just because it stuck really close to the manga and you almost need a little bit more story there. They did a lot of extra padding in the old version, which sometimes went a little too far. They didn't need quite as much, but uh, a lot of it was character development. And with sticking close to the manga, it meant that everything moved so quickly you didn't get of any of the extra development. It was basically just you have a new uh, sailor soldier introduced every week and nothing happened in the meantime and sooner or later you're done like 10 episodes in you've defeated Queen Beryl and that's it. So it just moved too quickly and just felt a little impersonal. So it wasn't my favorite, but the original is still good. Um, my favorite season was always S. I felt like that was the most mature of all the seasons. I'm gonna go in with a darker color now, just to deepen up this teal. I also tend to watch a lot of really relaxing anime. Uh, stuff that maybe doesn't necessarily require you remember whole lot of plot from week to week so um Mushi Shi is really good for that. It doesn't necessarily have a huge ongoing plot. <clears throat> you just have to kind of be there and enjoy it from episode to episode. It's about this guy who kind of wanders around from village to village and he helps them with uh like spiritual infestations. And it's not a scary show. It's, it's honestly kind of tranquil. Because the spirits are usually inhabiting a person or a place for a reason. And it's not anything to do with um, something scary or horror related. And he sets them free. So it's just a really nice show to watch whenever you want to. You don't have to uh, watch it all at once if you don't want to. March Comes In Like a Lion is also really nice. It does have a little bit more of an over overarching plot, but still has a really relaxing tone to it. It does have to deal with uh, mental health a little bit, or quite a bit actually, um, but it also has to do with shogi 
which is kind of like chess, more complicated than that. But it's um, a really nice way to just sit down with an anime that has really sort of peaceful background music. The animation is done in a really beautiful way. And it just kind of takes you on this journey to this family's life. And it's uh, definitely what I would call a slice of life show. I definitely tend to revisit um, animated shows in general. So some of my older um, like Disney and Nickelodeon shows that I would watch when I was a kid, Winnie the Pooh, Hey Arnold, Goof Troop. Um, and then some newer shows like We Bear Bears from Cartoon Network, Steven Universe. And the Tales of Arcadia series on Netflix is really wonderful as well. And that's supposed to be finishing at some point this summer. And the Tales of Arcadia series includes uh, Troll Hunters and Three Below. For comedy, I usually go for things like um, just a really fun half hour comedy set at a community college and a bunch of <laughs> raggedy misfits. Um, the IT crowd, Shameless UK, I tend to watch a lot of UK comedies. Um, I find them pretty funny. Sci-fi series, Misfits is one of my favorites, which is about a group who have uh, been gifted somewhat special powers during a lightning storm uh, during their community service. And uh, some of the powers are more unique than others, but mostly it's just about their hijinks and what they get up to using those powers. And it's a fun show. Uh, Black Mirror is really good. I just got into Black Mirror like maybe a year or two ago. And um, it started in the UK and then kind of became a UK US production. And each episode is different from the last. So that's another show where you don't have to worry about the plot too much. You can just pick whatever episode you want and watch it. You can watch them out of order if you want to. And of course, Orphan Black is one of my favorites. Orphan Black is a Canadian show starring Tatiana Maslany. And she is absolutely amazing. She plays multiple roles. And she makes each one completely different from the last. And it is so good. From the center of my lid, I'm taking... A shimmer, which is like a, a pastel pinky purple. I'm just using my finger for that. And for drama series, there's really only one that I continue to go back to again and again and again. It's Sherlock. <laughs> I love that show so much. I just, I've seen it so many times, I really have. It's just an updated version of Sherlock Holmes set in modern day England and Benedict Cumberbatch is Sherlock Holmes, Martin Freeman is Watson and there's a few other people here and there. But those are the main two. For some newer shows that I've watched and really loved, uh, Raising Dion, which I just found out recently is getting a season two, so that's awesome. Uh, it's based on a comic book about a young boy who uh, finds out that he can do various things with his mind, like he can move objects, he can transport himself various distances, uh, and his mom is the one looking after him because his father died in a really strange storm up north. Um, and they kind of slowly find out over time that he's not the only one who can do these things. Uh, but the lightning storm is chasing him, and uh, there's something in it, so it's very cool. Um, Giri Haji is really, really good. It's a part Japanese, part UK production about a man who finds out that his brother was involved with the Yakuza and he goes over to England to help the detectives there solve the case since his brother was last seen in England. Uh, Lock and Key is also based on a comic book and it's about this family who moves into this old home called the Key House and they start finding these different keys that do different things. Sometimes you can insert them into a door and have it uh, transport you anywhere that you can think of. Sometimes you can put one into the back of your neck and have it change your appearance. Like, they do so many different things. And I haven't heard yet if that's getting a season two, but season one was good. 
My Hollow Love is a Korean show. It's kind of a sci-fi romance. <laughs> and it's about this woman who is given this AI tech. So it's a wearable tech in a form of glasses and it projects a hologram companion. And over time she becomes really attached to the companion and finds out that there's another person out there who looks just like him and he's the one who made it. There's also like some government conspiracy trying to cover up the AI and <laughs> it's like really cheesy at times but so fun to watch. I really liked it. Uh, the Boys was it was so much fun it wasn't what i was expecting i don't know what i was expecting but the boys is basically making fun of superheroes in a really darkly humorous way the superheroes are are the bad guys <laughs> basically <laughs> they're really corrupt uh there's a lot of violence on the show and uh it's a it's so much fun um and that's supposed to have a season two, but I don't know when because, um, well, a lot of things have been pushed back, obviously. OA, which ended after season two pretty abruptly, that's kind of a weird show for a lot of people. Not everyone's going to like it. It's done by Britt Marling, who uh, writes all of her own sci-fi movies, and this is her first series. Um, and it's, it's kind of hard to explain so <laughs> you're probably best just to watch it okay it's about this girl who goes missing for quite a few years and she was blind at the time that she left and when she comes back her sight has been regained and she claims to be some sort of angel and she starts retelling her story to like a group of people who then kind of like worship her and there's time travel and parallel worlds and I told you it was weird. <laughs> I'm taking some of the brighter turquoise underneath my lower lash line. So books and comics. Now, I don't tend to read a lot when I'm not feeling well, so there's that. But I decided to compile a small list in case you wanted some reading material. I tend to read a lot of comics just because um, they're a bit easier for me to read and digest. I do have um, issues with headaches and just over the last few years find it harder to retain some information. So comics are easier for me for sure. So I love the fables series uh basically about a whole bunch of fairy tale characters in modern day new york and it's it's part fantasy it's part comedy it's part action it's got everything you need in one place a lot of shows like once upon a time were supposedly at least partially based on fables which started in the mid 2000s and wrapped up in 2016 or something like that. Wayward is one that I am rereading right now, only I I finally have, uh, I've bought the rest of the series now that it's done. I was reading it when it was still ongoing, and now that it's done I decided to buy the rest of it. It's about a girl who moves to Japan, uh, where her mom lives. She's part Japanese. And she meets a bunch of different people there who have different powers, as she finds out she does as well. And they kind of fight different yokai there. And yokai are kind of ancient Japanese creatures. And at the end of each book, it's really cool. They have an appendix telling you about yokai and Japanese folklore, which is really interesting. And they go pretty in depth about the meaning of each creature and... Um, its historical significance. It's just a really beautifully drawn book. And one of the best books that I read last year was actually uh, The Pretty One by Kia Brown. She's a disability advocate and she herself has cerebral palsy. 
the book is sort of a series of essays about her experiences as a disabled black woman. There was so much that I could relate to as someone who has been disabled for several years, um, but also a lot that I could learn from her experiences since uh, I have never experienced medical racism or any form of racism. It's just an excellent book. I've been telling other people to read it since it's a fairly new book and just a really well-written book. Especially for people who don't have disabilities, I think it's really important for them to read books by disabled authors. Video games. I definitely have to mention some video games because video games are one of my actually biggest escapes. I'm taking a matte pink by the name of Creme on my inner corner. So for console games, I decided to split it into console and mobile games. The Last of Us is one of my most played games of all time. It's one of my favorite games of all time. And barring any unforeseen circumstances, the second one is supposed to come out on May 29th. And that's a post-apocalyptic survival shooter. You play as a guy named Joel who's lost his daughter and then 20 years later uh, he's fighting fighting against infected people uh, with the cordyceps virus and hunters who are also in this world and they aren't very good people and there's a girl named Ellie who's about 14 and she's immune to the virus and he has to transport her across the country in order to see if she can be used for a vaccine. The same people who made this game also made the Uncharted series, which is also one of my favorites. Uncharted 4 and Lost Legacy are probably my most favorite um, just because I felt like the storylines were a little bit more mature and uh, Lost Legacy, Lost Legacy in particular was quite cool because you got to play as two women, pretty badass women. The Persona series is a Japanese role-playing series, and uh, it's it, it, the storyline varies from game to game, but you're usually playing as a high school student who finds out that there's a living alter ego inside of you. Uh, that will help you in battle against other personas, other creatures. And you usually have a, a whole bunch of teammates that will help you out as well, and they all have personas. And during the day, you build your social links with your companions and go to school and do all these activities. And then at night, you're battling monsters, and it's, it's fun. <laughs> Chrono Trigger is one of my favorite games of all time. It was released on the Super Nintendo probably a good 25 years ago. I'm just putting a duochrome pink on top of the inner corner. And it has to do with time travel and saving the world, as one usually does in Japanese role-playing games. I'm just putting that same pink duochrome on the right bone. The Professor Layton series is a really cool puzzle game series that it does have a storyline going throughout each game. And you're just playing as this, as this cool English professor who solves mysteries in these different towns. Um, and the way you do that is you speak to different people, they give you a puzzle, and the story just kind of keeps going until you reach the finale and find out what's going on. And uh, the puzzles are actually pretty difficult. It's for all ages, but um, adults and children alike will have trouble with some of the puzzles in these games. They're not just like really simple things to do. Um, and Phoenix Wright is another series that was started on the DS and then it's kind of progressed to different platforms over time. You play as a lawyer and you solve different cases. Um, usually you have two different things that you do. You kind of inspect crime scenes and then you present evidence in court. 
and um, the gameplay in that is just really fun and finding out the culprit and everything like that is really neat. I know everyone is like really into Animal Crossing. I'm not going to offend anyone by saying I don't like it because I do like Animal Crossing, but I'm going to offend a few people by saying I've always liked Harvest Moon way more. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just do. Now, Harvest Moon is now known as Story of Seasons, which is its Japanese name. And you get to play as a little farmer, and you get to date people, and to me, there's just so much more to do in Harvest Moon than there's ever been in Animal Crossing. And uh, Rune Factory is like the fantasy version of Harvest Moon, so if you want even more to do, you can do all the farming, you can do all the dating, and you can fight monsters. So, I mean, there's that. <laughs> Stardew Valley is basically the same as Rune Factory. In that you can play as a farmer, you can date, and you can fight monsters. The only difference is, is, it, is it's Americanized and has the ability to date guys or girls no matter what gender you make your farmer. And I'm just putting on some Physician's Formula Eye Booster in Ultra Black. And lastly, the Nino Kuni series is one of my favorites. Nino Kuni 1 and Nino Kuni 2 are quite different. Nino Kuni 1 is a little bit like Pokemon in the sense that every time you were in battle, Whichever monsters you you go up against, you have the ability to catch them and then use them later in the game. In Nino Kuni 2, you did not have that option. You have Higgledies that can help you in battle, which are like little Pikmin, but you don't capture anything. And it's much more of a real-time action RPG, whereas it was a little bit split in the first game. You can play one without having played the other, and they're both great. Well, now I've gone and done it. I did this eye thicker than this eye. For newer games, Days Gone came out last year. I did a review on it. It's a huge game. I was playing it every day for a month and a half straight before I finished it. And that's an open world zombie game. Um, AI, The Somnium Files, I just beat it. I have not gotten all the trophies, but I just beat it. It was about 30 hours. Um, and it's, it's sort of like a, it kind of diverges into different paths, but you will get all of the paths eventually on your playthrough. And, uh, you play as a futuristic detective trying to solve the Cyclops killings. Very cool story. It does have a lot of humor in it still. Um, whenever it gets too dark, they kind of sprinkle some in there for you. Um, I just played the demo of Trials of Mana, which is really good. It is a re remake of Seiken Densetsu 3, uh, which was only available in Japan until very, very recently. So it will be cool to play that. Uh, and some mobile games. The Room series, which is kind of a dark puzzle series where you're in like these old mansions and you're trying to find clues on different objects and like not a hidden puzzle game. But you're kind of, um, you're tapping on the object and maybe you'll find like a panel opens up and there's a key. Where do you put the key? You have to go over here and put the key in there. It gets really intricate and the music is like unsettling. It's kind of a horror puzzle game. Uh, Monument Valley, if you want a puzzle game that's like not so dark and chilly, <laughs> then this is really cute. And the characters are just adorable. Uh, beautiful music in the background that's really soothing. And uh, Color Zen is another one if you want more like upbeat music, but still kind of relaxing at the same time. And Blendoku, really cool if you're into like color ombres. I'm using the Essence Lash Princess False Lash Effect Mascara. For my cheeks today, I'm using the Milk Makeup uh, Tinted Glow Oil Lip and Cheek in the shade Flare, which I don't think I've ever actually used on camera, but I've had it for quite a few months now and I really like it. And of 
course, you can also do some other activities other than watching something, reading something, playing something. So you could, you could bake. Baking is always nice. I've been doing some baking with my mom over these last few weeks. And there's so many different recipes these days. You don't need a cookbook. You can find recipes on the internet. You can follow recipes on YouTube. You could do a puzzle. A jigsaw puzzle, go old fashioned. Of course, there's apps on your phone where you can do jigsaw puzzles, but I like to do them for real. My brother actually, actually got my mom a puzzle for Christmas where you put it together and then you color it in, which is a neat idea. So that's another thing you can do, coloring. Coloring books, or you could print some coloring sheets off the internet if you have access to a printer. You could write something. If you're the kind of person who likes to write, I like to write poetry sometimes. I've gotten back into poetry again. I also am a patron of Lisa Renee Hall's. I can leave her Patreon link down below. And in her community, we do something called expressive writing. Expressive writing is a kind of a form of therapy. It is, at least I find it to be. And she'll put up a category, say, about perfectionism, which we talked about when we were talking about Black Swan, and a series of prompts just asking you some different questions about how perfectionism was molded in your life, say. And you'll write an answer to that, or maybe even just how that question made you feel. And you can answer one question, you can answer all of them. By the end of it, you write your reaction to everything that you've written down. And you'll probably find that there's something there. Uh, I just find it very useful for tapping into different things. It's supposed to help you unpack your biases. And I find that it does that. I find it also helps me with just things I didn't realize I'd internalized, like my ableism. Uh, a lot of things for me are usually tied back to that, including my perfectionism. I overperform because I know that there's certain things I can't do. And I didn't know that before I started writing with Lisa, so it's just something to consider if you find that certain kinds of therapy don't help you and you're more of an introspective person. You can make videos like I do, even if you're not really a huge YouTube person. Maybe you could video chat with someone who you know. Uh, maybe you could video chat on Instagram with some of your followers. I think it's good to practice physical distancing, not so much social distancing. I think we need to stay social right now. And I'm just putting on sort of a rosy tone lipstick. A few last things. You could try a new craft or craft something that you already know how to do. Paint nights have gone virtual and are at much lower, co lower cost. Some of them are even free. So that's a great thing to do by yourself or with someone else that you live with. Hit Record is a great open collaborative website. If you want to create something, you can throw something out there for others to contribute to your collaboration or you can collaborate to somebody else's. And lastly, if you don't want to be productive during this time, you don't have to. A lot of people are going to be really stressed out right now. I'm feeling more stressed out than normal right now. Whether you're still working, whether you're not working, whether you worked before this or not, none of us really place high value on rest, taking care of our mental health and physical health. And so productivity can kind of just lay low when we need it to. We do not always have to be doing something. Uh, you can just be. Uh, and that's really what I wanted to say because I think we all need to kind of learn to just be okay with the idea of rest. And I have a whole video about placing value on productivity levels, which uh, you can watch if you'd like to. 
I'll leave that down below. I'll leave all of my makeup info down below and other places on the internet where you can find me if you'd like to. You can subscribe if you'd like to, and if you don't want to, that's okay. Just happy to have you here, and I uh, hope you enjoyed this little video. I know that it wasn't anything like too special, but I also just didn't want to place any more stress on people's lives than there are already. So I hope that you are all doing well. If you need to reach out, just leave me a comment. I'll get back to you. I always read my comments. I hope to see you very soon. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> Have a great day, evening, wherever you are. Bye, everyone.